I preached probably a little harder than I needed to in the first service. I've lost my voice, and so bear with me um, as I try to, uh, to do the best with this. But let's read the first 10 verses together, um, and you can follow along again on the screens. Verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partakers with them, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I want you to see three things in this text, church. Number one, that we're called to a godly love, to um, to imitate or or look like our Father, our Heavenly Father, in the way that we love. Uh, Secondly, that the world will try to deceive and trick us and, and sell us a counterfeit love. So we want to be on guard against a counterfeit love. And thirdly, we'll talk about loving the light and, and kind of begin what we'll look at more in depth next week of walking in the light as Christians. And so first one, we want to see a godly love among the church family initially and firstly, but also overflowing as a reputation to the rest of the world. Um, if you've been at our church very long, you know the Basham family puts the fun in dysfunctional. And, um, and one of the things that, that we have uh, become notorious as doing is when anytime we have any kind of competition in our family, it's, it's seen as very unhealthy. And um, one time my wife came out, out to Trace Creek with us and we were playing a game called Scategories where you roll a 26 uh, sided die. Um, y'all know where I'm, my, my family knows where I'm going because I'm still bitter about this. But um, we rolled a J and the, and the hint was something that comes in pairs and I came up with the word jeans. You wear jeans every day. It was a genius answer, right? And they began to argue with me and say, they don't come in pairs. It's just one item. It's not a pair. I'm like, it's literally called a pair of jeans. And so the game doesn't even go on. Like we flip tables over. I leave cussing. Like it's just a big blow up. And we get home and my wife is like traumatized. She's like, what just happened? And I'm like, family dinner. What are you talking about? Like everything's normal. It's cool. And, and what I realized was the way that my family communicated with one another, she did not understand that. And in the church, sometimes we, we're, we can be good or bad at assuming the best in someone and understanding the motives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we need to remember, especially as we look at this topic of emulating God's love, we need to remember that the world doesn't always understand our family. Matter of fact, they can't understand our family. They don't have the gospel lenses on their faces to see the way that we see, and they have not been resurrected from death into life. And so as the church um, walks in love, the world looks at the church and doesn't quite understand what's happening. And if we're not careful, sometimes it'll look like bickering and nonsense rather than the true love that is in our hearts for one another. And so we need to be mindful of that as we, um, as we reach into darkness to draw loved ones out of that and into the glorious light of Jesus. And as we look at how to emulate godly love, I think it has to be rooted in the beginning of the book of Ephesians. Remember, the first three chapters of this letter are doctrinal in its content. That means it's, it's, it's very theological. It's built upon Christian doctrine. And then the second three chapters are application of that doctrine. And so as we look and start this passage at Ephesians 5.1, to make sense of Ephesians 5.1, we have to look at Ephesians 1.5, back at the beginning of the letter, which says that God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, that God has uh, foreknown and elected and predestined us to be in his family, to be adopted into the family of God. That is the great and mind-blowing theological truth of the sovereignty of God, that, that, that he chose me it, to be in him and to be a Christian before the foundations of the world. And he drew me through my lifetime and, and, and brought about this redemption in my soul, brought me from death to life. And so in Ephesians 1.5, we see the doctrinal truth that leads us to the application of that truth in Ephesians 5.1, which says, therefore, be imitators of God. As what? As beloved children. Let this sink into your soul this morning, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you. 
that is as deeply as a father can love and as, 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 as much as you can meditate on that truth, it is far greater than what you can even comprehend. God's love for you. And then if that's not enough to just fry your brain, Paul says you need to imitate that kind of love. You need to act out that kind of love. The Greek word is mamates, which is where we get our word mime or mimic from. Um, just like an actor on a stage would pretend to be something, we can't perfectly be loving like God is loving. We can't perfectly emulate all the characteristics of God, but we ought to spend our lives trying to. We mimic God's kindness and forgiveness and holiness because we are his beloved children. You guys remember about my famous nachos? I've told you about them. This is, dad's in the room is a secret. When you have to cook for your family, just make the same crappy stuff you always do, but put the word dad's famous in front of it and your kids will love it. Okay, it's dad's famous nachos. It's not just nachos. And um, one of the things I do with dad's famous nachos is I put some jalapenos on some of them because I love jalapenos. And what I've seen happen is Tava, um, he, he's come to love jalapenos too, but sometimes when I look at his face, I'm like, I don't know if he really loves jalapenos. Like, his face is distorted and he's crying, snot running down his mouth. He's like, yeah, we're men eating these nachos, aren't we, dad? It's like, are you even enjoying this right now, bro? And, and what Tave is doing is he's, he's imitating, he's mimicking his dad. And in the same way that a child will uh, look up to and emulate and mimic their father, uh, Paul is calling us to imitate our heavenly father. That as the father has poured out um, unconditional, unfathomable love upon people that didn't deserve it, he's called us to do the same thing in the world. We pour out love on people, not because they deserve it, but because God has created us to do so. Your heavenly father loves you so much and he's calling you to love others so much as well. And verse two says, we don't just imitate the father, we also imitate the son. Verse two says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There's the word walk again. This, this word walk we see it first and clearly in chapter four, verse one, where Paul tells us to walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling. In chapter five, we see it three main times. We're told to walk in love here in this beginning passage and then the, uh, the consequential and sub subsequent two passages after it will be called to walk in light and also walk in wisdom. And you see this idea of walking and walking, that means carrying out your life in this way. So to walk in that holiness, love, light, wisdom, and it means our manner of life should be encapsulated with love. Not with love that comes from us, but a supernatural, heavenly love that's placed within us from God. As Christ loved us, is what verse 2 says. And so we don't just imitate the Father, we imitate the Son, and all this is done through the Holy Spirit, so we see this Trinitarian, again, echoing chapter 1 of Ephesians. And Jesus' love was so strong for us that Paul says that he gave himself Jesus himself taught that he was going to do this even before he went to the cross, but this is the sacrifice that brought you into the family of God, that for you to be adopted into the family of God, your sins had to be paid for and taken care of, and that was done by Jesus sacrificing himself through death on a cross and his resurrection. Jesus foretold this in John 15. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. And so this beautiful picture of Jesus doing what's necessary for us to be adopted, but then he says that he's laying his life down for his friends, that, that the perfect one would call himself our friends is a beautiful picture. And Paul calls it, he, he, he illustrates it, literally makes a picture of it by calling it a fragrant offering. Um, let me just tell you, I smell bad. Um, and I don't, I don't mean I stink. I might stink. I don't know. But, um, but I mean, I have a bad sense of smell. Even before COVID and, and half of us lost our smell. Uh, before COVID, I, I've just never really had a good sense of smell. Um, and, and so everything, you know, like all candles smell the same to me. Like I can't really distinguish those things. But Pastor Patrick, however, is a, is a man of uh, refinement. Um, and and he, he's a cologne connoisseur. And so... He's able to smell the, the subtle notes in those fragrances and things. And um, the image that Paul uses here is, is Old Testament imagery. It's, it's Hebrew imagery. And he's, he's referring back to in the Old Testament when offerings were brought to the temple. 
Uh, they would sacrifice an animal. They would burn that animal and also wheat and other things. They would burn oils and things like that in the temple. And, and it wasn't so much for the smells, but it was for the, the imagery because there were lots of symbols in the Old Testament to teach God's people about what worship meant. And so as the smoke from those offerings rose up, it was a vi visual illustration to them that their worship was rising up to their God. One example of that's in Exodus 29, one of many, many examples that I won't read a whole lot of them, but it says, burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. The principle that's communicated in the Old Testament is that right religious ceremony and worship is pleasing to God. It's like a pleasant smell in a home. And I, I just want to remind you as, you, as you prioritize church and attending on Sundays and, and setting apart the Lord's Day as holy in your week, let me just remind listen, I know that we ain't always got it together here. I know the coffee ain't always hitting right. Uh, last week, we didn't have any heat. Like, and the sermon's off probably more times than I care to admit, okay? But as we set that that time aside, this sacred time, as we set it aside to honor the Lord and our hearts are committed to that, it is described in the Bible as a fragrant offering. It always has been. We lift up our praise and we bring it, we limp in after the mess of the week we've had and, and whatever left is left of our voices that are weakened, we lift it up to God and it is described as a fragrant and pleasing aroma to him, hopefully. Sometimes though, our praise is masked in hypocrisy. You ever have smells that are just like nauseating to you? I stepped in dog poop the other day and <laughs> Micah smelled it immediately. And um, I didn't smell it until I got in the truck because I don't have a great sense of smell, but when you get in a truck, especially a truck as small as mine, right? Um, it's like, you can smell it. And, um, and I'm like starting to gag. The, the smell was so nauseating. Well, hypocrisy is, is repulsive to God. And when we, we come to church and we're getting our praise on just like faking it, and we've lived like hell through the week, and we come and, and, and act like holiness in church rather than a contrite heart full of repentance, then, then it, it's repulsive to God. And so what this passage calls us to is genuineness and sincerity, that we come with a, with a contrite heart and a truly repentant heart that we want to love God and we hate our sin because it distances us from our holy God. 2 Corinthians 2 is another example of Paul using the same language. He says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You catch that language. Among those who are being saved, i.e. the church, and among those who are perishing, i.e. the world. We are the fragrance that they have. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? That means that your life has a smell. One of my favorite things is um, when Stephen Ray became a member of this church, he's, he manages Fat Ash Cigar Lounge, so now I can go to the cigar lounge and call it work. That's one of my favorite things to do. And so I go to this cigar lounge and uh, you know spend an hour or seven there. And when I get home, my wife's like, just come in in your boxer shorts. Just leave all the clothes on the porch. I ain't trying to mess with that. And if I come in with the clothes on that I've been in the cigar lounge with, she can smell it all over me. She can smell the cigars. She can smell it in my beard. It's like there's no masking it. There's no hiding it. I don't matter if I become like a teen boy and put Axe body spray all over myself. Like, it ain't stopping it. She's got a nose like a hound dog and she'll know I've been at Fat Ash Cigar Lounge, okay? And, and, and just like that smell is so evident to anyone who's around me at that time, the, the, the imagery that Paul's using is that we have a spiritual smell, and he says not just among the church, but among those who are perishing, the world too. That everyone is going to know what your spiritual smell is. As you can hide it amongst the church people, but eventually the people around you are going to know what your true scent is. And so I just want to call you today to examine that. Are you walking in love as Christ loved you? Does your life smell like the gospel? Or does it smell and reek of hypocrisy? And so we need to reject all the hypocrisy and reject the counterfeit love of worldly things, which is the second, the second point today. We see that um, the world just tries to sell us 
um, this insincere love. It's a counterfeit of godly love, an unconditional, true agape love. Um, we, we fall in love with lots of things and, and temporal things and honestly quite easily and fall out of them quite quickly as well. One of the leading um, distributors of pornography is a website called Pornhub, and they, they conducted their own study and released this one time. Um, I, I remember seeing the report on Twitter that the most frequently commented word on their website of the pornographic videos was the word love. It shows how deeply misguided we are in understanding what love truly is. That as men look up these illicit, and, and women too, but look up this illicit imagery, um, they're saying, I love this. That's a sad counterfeit to the true love of God. The world sells humanity counterfeit love, and it's not a, it's not a new trend either. Ephesus was uh, the recipient of this letter, and Ephesus was, was famous for one of the ancient seven wonders of the world, the, the Temple of Diana or the Temple of Artemis. Artemis was uh, known as a goddess of wilderness, but also of childbirth, which involved, of course, fertility. And Ephesus was also fam famous for having a lot of temple prostitutes. And in an act of worship, in an act of godless worship, uh, people would hire out these prostitutes and um, engage in sexual immorality. And Paul addresses this in verse 3, and he says that this has no place in the church. The sexual immorality must be repulsive. The scent of it must be repulsive to people in the church because it's repulsive to God. In verse three, it says, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. The Greek word for sexual immorality here is porneia, which is a junk drawer term in Greek. And it's, it's almost all scholars agree that it's meant to encompass all forms of sexual immorality. Um, this would include fornication, which is sex outside of marriage, adultery, which is unfaithfulness in a marriage, homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality, incest, pornography, lust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jesus actually raises the bar and the standard of sexuality in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to, to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. He raises the bar to say not just the act of it, but the thought of it is just as repulsive to God and impure. This is the reason why Paul says that it must not be named among us. Not that we, not, not that we just don't conduct ourselves in it, but it, it wouldn't even be mixed in with the reputation that we have. Paul also includes this phrase, all impurity, which is an indicator of holiness, that we don't just put off immorality, but we pursue uh, what is good as well. And covetousness, which is the third sin listed, which is loving money, possessions, and materialistic things too much. And again, notice he doesn't just say, stop doing that mess. He says, let not these things be named among you. And so some of us will kind of convince ourselves, we don't care what other people think, and it doesn't matter what other people think, but the Bible disagrees with that. Your reputation does matter. Remember categories. The world is looking at the family of God, and they're judging the gospel based on how we act and how we are perceived to act. And so these sins need not even be named among us. There should not be a hint of suspicion of these sins in the life of a Christian. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't fall into these things and mess up and slip into these sins. Matter of fact, probably many of us do regularly. But we should hate that we do that. And if you're, if you're looking at these lists of three sins and you're saying, hey, I'm off the hook, I don't struggle with any of those three, well, verse four is for you. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So just in case you're one of the holy rollers that came here this morning and you think you're good and the Bible's missed you on everything, it's like, hey, stop with the foolish words, right? That, that probably encompasses everybody. I remember my Sunday school teacher when I was a teenager, he used to get so mad at us. He's like, y'all been telling dirty jokes lately? Like I'd be looking around and I'm thinking like people, there were like teenagers in there that were drunk on the weekend and he's like, y'all been telling dirty jokes, you know, and I'm judging everybody around me and, and I'm, but I'm telling dirty jokes and I think it ain't that bad. And he's like, y'all got to stop with those yo mama jokes. And, um, and the beauty of the Bible is that we, we try to like rank our sins. Like these are the really bad ones and these are the ones that like I do and I'm okay with. Uh, but the beauty of scripture is like in another passage, Paul makes a list of sinners and he includes murderers in the same list with people who are disobedient to their parents, right? 
So it's like, if you think like, like that you're okay with how you live, the Bible condemns all of us. There's none of us that, that escape the buckshot of scripture and condemnation. It hits all of us. And if you're like, hey, I haven't hit these real big things and these real serious things, I'm pretty sure you've been disobedient to your parents and you've been foolish in your speech. And so this means that all of us find ourselves in a place of needing saved from something, needing pulled out of darkness into light. And so whether we love money, sex, foolish talking, Paul's clear that if we continue in these things, they are markers of unbelievers, not believers. Verse five has some pretty harsh words. It says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. No inheritance means you're not part of the family. It means that you're not redeemed. It means that you're on a path toward hell. It means that God's wrath is upon you. Verse six says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And so he's saying, if some preacher comes to you and says, it's no big deal, Paul's saying it is a big deal. God's wrath rests on those who habitually live in these sins. And this should freak some of you out. This it should, it should scare us. It should cause us to examine our lives and say, oh man, am I really part of this family of God? Has Jesus really saved me? Let me encourage you with this. This is not a call for all Christians to be perfect. There ain't no perfect Christian. Amen? They don't exist. They will one day, but right now, no. And, and so I don't want you to get to thinking that when you, when you fall into sin, that you've got to walk an aisle and pray a sinner's prayer and get saved all over again, that God's booted you out of his family for something you've done wrong. Ask yourself this question. When you fall into sin, do you mourn it? Or when you fall into sin, do you ignore it? That's a good litmus test for whether you're in the family of God. Those of us who are in God's family, when we fall into sin, and it happens often, we mourn that it happens. As we walk in holiness, as we walk in love, as we walk in light, as we walk in wisdom, sometimes our sinful feet trip us up and we fall into sin. But the sons and daughters of God mourn that we mess that up. And we beg for forgiveness and we right our wrongs and we try as sincerely as we can to minimize those things. But if you live in sin and you ignore it, Paul's pretty clear here. You're not in the kingdom of Christ. Not a part of the family. R. Kent Hughes says, do Christians fall into these sins? Of course. But true Christians will not persist in them. For persistence and sensuality is a graceless state. Again, let me remind you, the mission and witness of the church are at stake. How many times have we seen prominent Christian leaders fall and bring reproach upon the bride of Christ because of these sins? It happens all the time. My prayer is may a millstone drag me to the bottom of the ocean before I would bring reproach upon Jesus' bride. That, that I, I want all of us to understand that the reputation of the gospel is important because there's a world that needs to see it. There's a world that needs to be enlightened. And so let's look at the third thing, loving the light. You see, all those sins that Paul lists are darkness and we're called to be children of light. We're the antithesis to those list of sins as Christians. Verse seven says, therefore, do not become partakers with them. You're not to partner with those in these sins. You are to illuminate these sins and point them out and bring them to light. We ought to love that we've been called to do that. We ought to love the mission we've been put on. John 3.16 gives us this famous uh, oft-quoted verse that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And, and verse 17 says that those um, who denied him have been condemned already. And verse 19 tells us what that judgment is. Verse 19 says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Let me tell you something. I hate mornings with every part of my being. I hate waking up. I love my bed. I have a king-size memory foam bed, and I don't care if you think that's bougie. That's just how I live, baby. And listen, 
my wife and I, we made a big financial decision one time to buy a king-size memory foam bed. And I stressed out over that more than any, I've spent more money before, but I was just like, man, this feels like a waste because I just sleep on it. And as you start to get older, you start to realize that's worth it. And man, if something ever happened to my bed, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably just buy another one, like without, no matter what the interest on the loan was, I'd just make it happen. But I love that thing so much that every morning when I got to get out of it, I'm mad. Like I hate it. I love sleep and I hate waking up. And the longer I sleep, the more I love being asleep and the more I love staying in bed. And when my wife flips the light on, I realize, man, I fell in love with darkness last night and I don't want that light on. <laughs> Makes me mad. Turn it back off. <laughs> Let me remind you, Christian, that the people in your life that you love, you've got a hard job. The Bible calls you to flip the light on in their life and they don't like it. And you love them, and you want them to love you. But your call is to people in darkness, not just who are in darkness, but people who love the darkness they're in. And you're called to bring illumination to them. And you're called to call them out of the darkness, out of their comfort, and you're called to call them into marvelous light, into something uncomfortable, but eternally life-saving. Here's what's described as you. The world is described as people who love darkness, but son and daughter of God. Listen, 1 Peter 2 says that you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What a wonderful truth. And we love the light we've been called into, and we get the awesome privilege of calling others into that light. Look at what verse 8 says in our main passage. For at one time you were darkness. One time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. I love this verse because Paul doesn't say, at one time you were in darkness. You notice that? Paul says, at one time you were darkness. We live in a Appalachian redneck culture that loves to blame the devil for everything, right? Devil made me do it. Devil's been after me this week, preacher. Devil's, devil's right behind my back on everything I do. We, we tend to make ourselves the victims of, of things that maybe aren't actually really getting after us. You see, depravity means that we're the villains, not the victims. And, and, and our task is to go into a world who loves darkness and communicate to them, you're not the victim, you're the villain. But I've got good news, because I've got a savior who doesn't want to destroy the villains, but he wants to redeem the villains. He wants to make friends out of the enemies. He wants to turn the enemies of light into sons and daughters in the light. What a glorious truth and message that we get to carry. Amen, church? Verse 9 says, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You see, we spend a lot of time, definitely more than we should, trying to please the wrong people. We worry about people's opinions of us. We worry about how we look, how we're perceived. Um, we spend a lot of time on social media sharing our own highlight reels of things that make us look good and, and not sharing the, the things that don't make us look good. And I'm not saying you got to put all your mess out there. Most of us don't want to see that, okay? That's fine. But what I want you to see is that we probably devote way more of our energy and mind effort to pleasing people than pleasing God. And the Bible calls us to discern Discern means that we put effort into, we meditate on, we have knowledge of, which means we read scripture, which means we devote ourselves to the gospel. And when we discern what is pleasing to the Lord, it means that we put a lot into understanding and knowing what the Lord wants from our lives. What is a pleasing aroma to God? It should not be a strange subject to us to know how God wants us to live. So verse 10 says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, hallelujah for the word try. There is grace when we fall. 
There is understanding when we sin. Your sins were paid for at the cross. If you've repented of your sin and become a Christian, hear me very clearly. All of your sin was taken care of at the cross. It's not like you're going to go out and commit a sin tomorrow, and if you don't ask for forgiveness, you ain't making it to heaven. Jesus knows all the sins you're going to commit tomorrow and the rest of your life. He knows every sin you're going to commit, and he took care of it at the cross when he cried out to tell us that it is finished. It is paid in full, paid for all of your sin debt. But what that means is that you don't live in the mess that he pulled you out of, that you don't love the darkness that he flipped the light on to expose, that we try to discern, that we make earnest effort at progressive sanctification, that we want to look more and more and more like Jesus the older that we get. I've not known anyone, a single person, to get up in years and say, I regret the time I devoted to Jesus. This is something I've not heard. Matter of fact, as someone who's been around a lot of funerals and unfortunately has held a lot of hands on deathbeds, I've heard quite the opposite. I've heard I wish I would have been in church more. I wish I would have carried out his mission more. I wish I would have devoted myself to God more. I ain't heard nobody say, Man, I wasted a lot of time doing that Jesus stuff. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord.